Big room. How are you doing? Um, <laughs> got a few fans. Um, we're going to talk today about uh, Ancestry DNA. And it's a pretty unique application that uses the Hadoop ecosystem to scale. It's a little bit about our journey you know, with Hadoop and how we learn to use it. So I hope it's fun and entertaining. I'll take questions afterwards. Um, so uh, here we go. First, a little bit about Ancestry. We have 1,400 uh, employees worldwide, over 400 in dev and operations. Um, we've got 10 petabytes of images, structured, unstructured data, um, user contributed content, family trees um, on the site. Um, taking a look at uh, what we use, um, we use Hadoop, HDFS, MapReduce. We're also using HBase. And for workflow, we're using Azkaban. I'm really going to talk about Hadoop and HBase more than anything. So, what am I going to cover? Um, you know, I'm going to try to describe the problem that we're using, um, discoveries with DNA, why we're doing DNA. We measure everything. Um, there's three steps that we've tried to optimize with Hadoop. I'll talk about the performance and what's coming next for this project. Okay, let's talk about discoveries with DNA. Um, we do an autosomal DNA test, um, over 700,000 SNPs. Um, our database right now has 400,000 um, users in it, samples in it, processed. And we've been able to identify uh, 30 million um, relationships, uh, what we call um, fourth cousin relationships. And for a fourth cousin relationship, it means that um, you have a common ancestor about 150 to 300 years ago in your um, DNA. Your DNA points that out. And there's a high degree of accuracy. It's over 90% accurate. So as the database grows, we get more of those fourth cousin matches. And uh, that's a curve we really like to see. Um, what's a pipeline? We've seen a lot of pipelines in this uh, event. A lot of people have clickstream pipelines, pipelines for um, sensor data. Well, we have a pipeline that takes DNA data and processes it and crunches it through. Um, we have three key steps. We do the ethnicity. Um, there's an academic uh, program called Admixture that we used. For matching, we've started with an academic program called Germline and rewrote our own. We'll talk about that. And then I'll tell you what phasing is later, um, but we took Beagle was the academic program, and we created Underdog. When we put the first pipeline together, it ran on a single box, right? It worked. It supported the business, but all we could do was scale vertically. And we knew that it wasn't going to last. Okay, um, one of the key things we did, uh, we measured every step. And we kept track of everything. We put it in spreadsheets. Um, we monitored all of it. The, and the most important thing we did is we used the data collected to predict future performance. So as we were using, uh, going on this journey, we knew when we were going to hit a wall. We knew when it was going to come close. We knew when we were close to fall over, and we had to uh, innovate to get beyond things. Um, so here's the challenges and pain points. And, it, and as the DNA pool size grows, things change three different ways. First, by the batch size, the number of new, um, new samples that you're adding to the database, um, that's fairly static. If we usually run a, a batch size of about 1,000 people, so if I ran 2,000 people, um, it'd take twice as long. Uh, other steps were linear by the DNA pool size. The bigger the pool size got, the longer the step took. But the ones that were really scary were the ones that were quadratic. Some of the matching-related steps were time bombs. And they would eventually slow us way, way down. And those were the ones that we had to take care of. Um, and so what did we do first? We didn't address the time bombs. We started with something that was pretty simple. Um, and uh, I hope you're not offended, but we used Hadoop as a job scheduler to uh, scale one of our steps. And so why did we do this? I had really smart engineers with no Hadoop experience. I had a pipeline running on a single box that wouldn't scale. And I had a business that needed to grow. So I had to figure out how to start. 
And this was a pretty basic, simple way to start. We got a simple MapReduce implementation. We got experience running jobs on Hadoop. And we freed up other resources on that uh, single box to do more work. So you know, you know, don't, don't be offended by this. You know, but this is what we did. For a batch of 1,000, we created 40 jobs with 25 samples per job. And we ran um, a, map, a mapper that literally started a pro the process and allowed it to run and handle one of the um, inputs. You know, and then that fed through to a very simple reducer that just stitched together the output file. So it's a very simple step, but it worked. And it got us out using Hadoop, and it got my guys um, experience in the ecosystem. It was a really, really good step. And it worked, right? Um, so we went from processing 500 samples in about 20 hours to processing 1,000 samples in about two and a half. And um, by getting this process off my single box, I improved the steps that were still remaining on that box. And you can see everything got nice, flat, and predictable. And this provided really valuable experience for my team, and it bought us time. And if you're in an agile process supporting a business, it's really important that you support that business, keep moving forward, and make progress. So that's, uh, that's really what we did. Um, the next step, we really started to attack uh, some of those quadratic uh, matching steps. And so we moved um, uh, the germline, uh, created our own version of the match matching um, using MapReduce and HBase. Um, so what's germline? Germline is an algorithm uh, that came up with by some really bright people at Columbia University. It's a paper. Um, you can go there and read the paper. But it also is a C++ implementation of reference implementation of that paper. Um, it's great for an academic situation. You can uh, run a whole bunch of DNA through it, you know, 1,000, 10,000, you know, maybe more. But um, it really wasn't built for an industrial setting. So um, as we looked at the metrics and we looked at how things were going, we knew it was going to slow to a crawl. Um, you know, it was a great way to start, but it wasn't going to scale. And this is what happened to us. As I looked at the, as the database grew, and now realize we're already over 400,000 samples, so we're well beyond this, you know. Um, and as we got uh, around um, 60,000 samples in our database, it was taking us nearly 25 hours to process the samples. So we were really getting close to hitting a wall. Um, and then we projected where it was going. And so as we got to about 125,000 samples, you know, just to add another 500, 500 samples to the database, we were going to take 29 days. You know, and that's not good for a business. You know, so we had to do something, and we had to address it pretty quick. Okay, so um, I'm going to take you through a matching walkthrough. Um, it's a simplified example of how the code works. Um, any Game of Thrones fans? Anybody out there? Game of Thrones? Okay, then you should like this. You should like this. Okay, so here's how it works. You know, you got two people, you know, two samples, and you have all the alphabet soup, the A, T, C, Gs, and for each chromosome, we just lay it all out. Here's all, uh, all the data. Um, and the next step, um, and this is a really simple example. We separate this into words. Um, the reality is, uh, and this is really simplified, um, we break it into 96 character words and we do it for all um, 22 chromosomes, so this is really simple. Um, next, you build a hash table, right? You take the values at the particular positions and you say who has what value where. And you can see that uh, Cersei and Joffrey share um, some common strands in their DNA. Okay, then you iterate through that hash table and you see where they match. And so they match at positions one and two. And so, what's it mean? Are they related? And if you watch the show, you really know they're related. You know, so maybe. Um, we use the total length of all the shared segments to estimate the relationship between two genetic relatives. So it's really basically a classification problem at this point. 
you know, so how many strings, you know, how long is the segments that uh, they share, and that's uh, how we calculate the relationship. So now we add somebody else. And so you add Jamie. And you take his DNA. Well, we start um, with HBase, and this is where HBase does, works really, really well. You know, um, the key is a chromosome, the, the word or the value, and the position on the chromosome. And that makes a unique entry um, into the hash table for HBase. And then for every column, we add, you know, every user in our, um, in our uh, database, if you think about it. And then and the actual cell is a one if they have that value at that chromosome at that position. Okay, so we have Cersei and Joffrey already in um, HBase. And we have a um, results table um, where they're also both in, where every place they match shows up in that table as well. Okay, so now when we add Jamie, we add another column to the hash table on top with his data and um, match it all up. And in the results table, we add a column and a row and just uh, grow that as well. Okay, so uh, it's a great example of how HBase works. It's really cheap and inexpensive to keep adding rows and adding columns, you know, and it really, really does scale well, well on top of HDFS. But wait, we have more people, and there's more people to uh, process. So what do we do? So we run them in parallel on Hadoop. Okay. So what does parallel mean? So batches are usually about 1,000 people. Um, each mapper takes a single chromosome for a single person, you know, and we run it through um, two MapReduce jobs. The first job does that splitting up and matches the word, updates the first hash table, and the second job actually matches the segments. Okay, and it looks somewhat like this. This is a simplified view. So the first thing we run is the hash table mapper. So again, we take all the input for everybody, break it into words, fill in the hash table. Um, the re reducer um, really doesn't do anything in this step. And then the results mapper goes through that first hash table, and for each new user, reads the hash table and fills in the results table. Okay? And then finally, you put, put out um, the equivalent output for user one and user two. Here's all the matching segments. Um, Okay, so this is what happened. When we finally got this out and running, um, it was a huge success, um, and our performance went uh, down and flat. Um, best, best of all, uh, this became, the process became linear, and I could scale horizontally. So as we grow, I just have to add more clusters to the, uh, to the Hadoop, more nodes to the Hadoop cluster. Okay. And this was the original predicted um, graph. And you can see we never fell off the edge. And we went back and became very stable um, and very performing. You know, it's great for the business. OK, so let's talk about the performance and about what we learned. Um, we work with uh, a science team, um, population geneticists and bioinformatics. And they look, took a hard look at the output for the algorithm. And um, they, we talked, and, and they said, you know, we've made it linear. So again, that makes it easier for us to scale. Um, we are also, uh, we improved the accuracy of the original germline algorithm. We actually found a bug in the original C++ reference code. Um, and when you use something as a reference code and find a bug, it's kind of difficult. You wonder what you did wrong, and it takes a while to prove that the bug was actually in the other code. Um, and we're um, looking to improve this. Um, we're balancing the false positives against the false negatives. A false positive is where I say there's a relationship between two people and there really isn't. A false negative is when there is a relationship but we don't find it. You know, um, the next step, what we're doing with this, this code, um, we're moving to a binary version of this code. It'll use less memory and improve the speed. Um, and we've actually submitted a paper describing the implementation on Hadoop, and we're releasing it as an open source project soon once that paper is accepted and published. You know, so, um, 
So that's germline. Okay, um, the next thing, phasing, is uh, another step that we've moved to MapReduce. And phasing is when you have your DNA and you have, uh, you know, two pairs, AC or TG, you have the, you know, the, you know that, you know, you have both those, but you don't know did one come from mom or did one come from dad. So what phasing can do is run it through a statistical algorithm and a reference and be able to say, all these came from mom and all these came from dad. And then what that does is then if you feed it into the matching, it makes the matching much more accurate. So it's a pre-step to the matching. Okay, um, so um, phasing went to the dogs. Um, the original program used in academia is an open source program called Beagle. Um, it's a freely available program. It's a multi-threaded process that runs on one computer. Um, and you think, okay, let's scale this. Let's take um, a thousand, you know, take each individual sample and um, fork off a thousand versions of Beagle and um, get them all back in once. Well, um, Beagle is actually much more accurate if you run one 1,000 set samples through it. Um, and it's just the statistics and how it works. It's actually more, more accurate with a large sample set. So we couldn't just break things up, throw it out there, and pull it all back. So we had to do something that was uh, um, much more, you know, much smarter. So our replacement for it was, is a MapReduce uh, um, implementation we called Underdog. That came from our DNA science team. Um, it does the same statistical calculations, but it has a larger reference set. And the bigger the reference set is, that's the more accurate the, the results are. We carefully split this into a MapReduce implementation that allows parable, parallel processing. And again, this is a collaborative effort between the DNA science team and the pipeline developers. And um, you know, it's, it's really interesting to get the science and the developers together, you know, exchanging ideas and, and talking. Okay, so what did that look like? Okay, you take the input, the unfazed input, and then the first thing you do is you do a, what we call a window mapper. The first thing you do is you break up that input into windows. It's sort of like the hash table, but um, windows are um, strands of um, 500 characters, and you just break it up. And so that first mapper puts out you know, a window ID, an object with the user, and that um, particular window, you know, the raw DNA for unfazed DNA for that window. Then it goes into the reducer, and that for each window ID, it gives you an entire array of all the user DNA at that particular window. Now this is where, if, if you really understand your application and you really think about it, um, you, can, you can optimize things really well. Um, the window data, that the reference data you use to compare for the statistical analysis, if you load it all the time, that's really expensive. It's a lot of data, load it in. You, you want to build it in such a way that you load that data once and then run through everything and um, don't, don't load it multiple times. So the phase mapper loads the window data over once for that particular window and then walks through um, all the users that, and, all, and does all the matching for that window for all the users with their raw DNA. And it outputs the user ID, the window ID, and the phase DNA. And then it goes into the reducer and we flip it around. And you get for each user an array of each, for each window, the phase DNA. And so that's how this worked. Um, it's a really good, uh, a really smart implementation by um, our, some of our developers. It's really, really slick. Um, and how did it perform? Um, we went from 12 hours of processing 1,000 samples on Beagle to under 25 minutes with a MapReduce implementation. We just literally you know, fell off a cliff you know, with our performance. And then we got better accuracy. You know, so um, it was really a, a huge success. So let's talk about performance and, and next steps. And this is really about incremental change. You're, going, you're moving along. You're supporting your business. How do you keep moving things forward and, and make incremental change and, and, um, in, an, in a very agile way? 
Um, we measure every step in the pipeline. So for every run and everything that we've had, you see some of our major releases. Um, you know, so in a way, we're supporting the business in a just-in-time, you know, agile way. And you can see the first point was admixture on Hadoop, and um, we made some big strides there. And then, as you notice, between there and the germ germline release, you see the blue area on the graph. That's where we were going, you know, uh, quadratic. That was G germline going quadratic, and then we re replaced it and suddenly we got control of our matching phase. Um, we had an Ethnicity V2 release, which, used, which made, us, uh, made the times for admixture go up. It didn't make our total time go up because we ran things in parallel, but it just made our ethnicity steps more accurate for our users. Um, finally, when we released Underdog, that got rid of um, the phasing step. And you can, and our time went way down. And all the time we were supporting the business. So um, we were, as uh, we kept growing the database, and it's still growing, growing strong. So what's next? Um, first off, uh, we need to build some different pipelines. So this is where Azkaban comes in. And it'll allow us to easily tie together different steps, change steps, you know, on Hadoop and make it very easy to drop in different steps in and out and cre create different pipelines. Um, we may want to uh, run some completely different you know, arrays with different DNA samples you know, and create a different pipeline to support that. Um, and this is a significant improvement over a hand-coded pipeline with what we started with. Um, and then um, we're looking seriously about moving a lot of this to the cloud. Um, as we do new algorithms, uh, if you think about it, you know, we do a new matching algorithm that's coming out. Um, it forces us to go back and rerun over the entire DNA pool. So, um, because you've paid us, you, you want to see more accurate matches. So, you want us to go back and rerun the data over your, your DNA and give you better matches. Um, so, to do that, um, we're looking at using the cloud for processing, you know, um, doing a, a little, it's not a true burst, but for us to go up and burst and, and reprocess and uh, get a new algorithm in place while supporting the current pipeline. You know, keep the current pipeline going and chugging along. So that's uh, looking at our cloud. Um, what's next? Um, the last thing that we have, you know, the first thing that we started with was our um, Poor man's implementation where we use MapReduce to start uh, admixture, kick it up, and just run it as a Hadoop as a job processor. Um, it's the last major academic algorithm that needs to be addressed. And we think we can uh, address it in a very similar way to um, how we did phasing. And so we expect to get some uh, big performance improvements out of that. And um, we also see some interesting issues as the matching continues to grow. You know, as the database continues to grow, the more matches per run, the more matches we're finding per run is increasing. So it's just the amount of data that we're, you know, processing and then having to pass over or pass off to the front end to show to the customers is just growing. And so we have to look at how we're going to change that handoff and do that. Um, but the key thing to remember is keep measure everything um, and adjust. And that's uh, the key, key thing that um, we're going to keep in mind. Um, so right now, um, that's it. And I have about 10 minutes left for questions, if you have any. Um, we are actually hiring for the DNA pipeline team. We'll be picky. You know, um, we're looking for um, some people who want some tough challenges. And I want to have a special thanks to both the DNA science team and the pipeline developer team. Uh, any questions? Yes. So typically one of the challenges with DNA matching is, is errors that you get from the sequencing. And you didn't talk about sort of the fuzzy matching problem. Um, we didn't. Um, with, uh, so one of the things that um, Beagle does with the phasing Right? It will also 
take some statistical calculations and try to correct errors. We also have a QC, a quality check that we do um, with every sample before we go through it. If we see too many errors, we'll send it back to the lab to be reprocessed, right? So, you know, we've got some checks and balances in place there. And with germline, you're right, there's a one more step that's the fuzzy matching. Once you get all the sequences, you've got to kind of take those last words and, and kind of go out and see how far into those last words the matching so you can get the entire segment for the match. So, you know, that's a step in the germline processing. I'm not sure. You're looking at me funny like uh, I'm not, you're not sure. It, just from the algorithms I've been reading about, the fuzzy matching was, was needed in multiple steps through the process, you know, to deal with just errors you don't know are errors. Like, yeah. if, you, if you have these 96 long sequences that you've arbitrarily split things up into, and one of the base pairs is wrong, then they're not going to match during the reduce phase, and then what do you do? Yeah, yeah that's, it's, it's in our, uh, G, it's in the germline algorithm and in the J germline algorithm. Too. Yeah, we do the we do a fuzzy matching step, and you're right. I skipped it. Okay. Fair enough. Any other questions? Um, thank you for your time. Appreciate you coming out. Um, it's really interesting to be up here and look out over a really really big room. You know, so um, appreciate it.